Hello and thank you for inviting me to talk at this fantastic celebration of your collective achievement. What an amazing story. And it's the storytelling of the Continuous Plankton Recorder Survey that I'm here to talk to you about today and to formally launch our brand new VR experience. But first, a little bit about myself. I'm Gareth Allen, the Managing Director of Soundview Media, a content production company based in Plymouth. We connect audiences with compelling stories on screen and over the past seven years we have been doing that in immersive spaces and more specifically in VR headsets just like this one. Most of our immersive content is created using 360 cameras. For example, we recently created a VR film for wheelchair users to experience what it's like to be at the helm of a fully accessible power boat as a way of encouraging them to get on board for real. Once we'd filmed and produced the VR, we were then able to share that virtual experience with our audiences. Some told us that they really got the sense of what it was like to be driving the boat. To tell the CPR story, we wanted to combine live action video with a virtual undersea environment so the viewer could get close up to the plankton and within the headset actually pick up a virtual copepod and examine it whilst discovering what happens to the plankton populations as water temperatures change. For us, this was a new and exciting and interactive way of communicating not only the importance of the survey, but the effects climate change is having on our ecosystems. With the help of the Marine Biological Association, the Marine Business Technology Centre and I Mayflower, we were able to achieve this. Thanks so much to Rowena Stern, Emily Deary, the MBA Sepia crew and the team at MBA for your assistance in the production. So what's next? Well, last week we were able to show an audience a sneak preview of the content at Plymouth's brand new multi-million pound immersive dome at the Market Hall. The immersive dome is Europe's largest 360 cinema. Next, we hope that school groups too will be able to come to this dome and other spaces like it. For example, Plymouth University's Immersive Vision Theatre to learn and explore and discover. What a fantastic opportunity this will be to tell the story of the CPR survey to a young and diverse audience, to inspire future scientists to follow in the footsteps of the amazing work the MBA has been doing for the past 90 years. Thank you and congratulations.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope you've had a lovely lunch, breakfast, brunch, dinner, sleep, depending on where you are in the time zones around the world. Um, great to have you back this afternoon. Really successful morning this morning. Hope you've really enjoyed it. Um, so we will be starting very shortly. Um, so hopefully you are all ready to go again for the next theme, which is on the topic of impact applications. And this afternoon, we are very um, delighted to be able to welcome Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Richard Thompson, um, who's going to be our chair. So Richard, are you there? And can you please switch on your camera and microphone? Hello, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm certainly here. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you, Richard. Brilliant. Yeah, so I shall hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much and welcome. I say, I hope everybody's had uh, an enjoyable lunch. I want to move on. We've got four talks uh, in this session this afternoon about impact and application uh, work. And the first talk is going to be given by um, Associate Professor Abigail McQuarters Gallup from the University of Plymouth. So, Abby, if I might hand over to you to the next uh, 15 minutes, and I'll, uh, well, I'll certainly give you a warning if it looks like you're running over time. Um, I sent in a video. Aren't, you, aren't they going to play the video? Yeah, we can play that okay. video for you, Abby. Yeah, no problem <laughs> okay. at all. That's just about to start now. Great. And thank just, you. just to add before you start oh. that video, if I could, Jack, sorry, apologies. It's just to mention also that the video that was played during the lunch by Soundview Media will be available in the chat function here as a link. And it's also going to be on our social media channel, the MBA UK. So sorry to interrupt the start of that presentation. Jack, if you could take that away. Thank you. Hi, I'm Abigail, and I'm an Associate Professor of Marine Conservation at the University of Plymouth. Uh, today, I want to talk about why we need the CPR as a key tool for delivering policy. So if, if we haven't met yet, um, I did my PhD with CPR data, and then I worked at Sophos for six years. And now I work on getting science used in policymaking um, with a focus on plankton science, and, uh, and that often involves CPR data. So as we all know, humans are impacting marine ecosystems. And I love this figure by Ben Halpern because it shows the extent of our impact on the marine environment. So right away, we can see pretty much every marine ecosystem in the world has been impacted by humans. And in 2019, ITBES declared a biodiversity emergency. And the report was pretty shocking and pretty upsetting. So they found 25% of species globally are at risk of extinction. And that extends to the marine environment. 33% of reef corals are at risk of extinction, 31% of sharks and rays, 25% of mammals, some of which are marine, 14% of birds, some of which are marine. And they found that natural ecosystems have declined by about 47% on average relative to baseline data. Shocking stuff. And it was picked up by the media. So the Guardian said that human society is under urgent threat from the loss of Earth's natural life. And of course, it hasn't gotten better in the last couple of years because now we're in the middle of the COVID pandemic nightmare and we're realizing that that's connected to biodiversity and that if we don't stop destroying biodiversity, we could have more pandemics like COVID or worse. So humans need marine biodiversity and because it delivers ecosystem services that we depend on, like the food that we eat, coastal, um, coastal protection, the air that we breathe, recreational opportunities, jobs, and it's this link to humans that is what is of interest to policymakers. But there's good news. So international agreements are increasingly recognizing the importance of marine biodiversity. So the UN Sustainable Development Goals, out of their 17 goals, number 14, Life Below Water, is all about the marine environment. In the middle, we've got the Convention on Biological Diversity Aichi targets. So 20 targets about biodiversity, and that includes marine. And then on the right, we've got the UK Marine Strategy and the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, and the goal of both of those pieces of policy is to achieve good environmental status of our marine environment. Um, and descriptor number one in the top left corner is called biological diversity. So biodiversity, um, is recognized by policy as being really important to humans. So the other good news is that there's lots of great science going on around marine biodiversity and good policy decisions are based on good science like this. So what I'm interested in is making sure that this science gets turned from just information 
into knowledge that we can use as evidence to policy for policy making. And the CPR data plays a key role in this process. So here's a, a map of the UK's integrated plankton monitoring program. And it might be hard to read if you're on your phone or your laptop, um, but on the right, we've got all the different time series in the UK and how long they are. And if they monitor phytoplankton, zooplankton, or both phytoplankton and zooplankton. And then on the left, we've got a map of where they're all located. So you can see lots of fixed point stations, mostly close to shore. And then we've got the CPR tracks. And we only showed one year of CPR data here, so we didn't overwhelm the map with CPR data. But CPR data are really central to the UK's integrated plankton monitoring program. You can easily see that CPR data is pretty much our only um, offshore consistent data set. And also the CPR time series is the longest time series of plankton that we've got. And it's one of the few time series to monitor both phyto and zooplankton. So the CPR is really important to our UK plankton monitoring program. And together, we need to figure out how to use all of these different data sets that have different methods and different lengths of time series together to provide the most robust evidence for policy that we can provide. So we've taken an indicator approach to doing that in the UK that have, has now been expanded to OSPAR, so to the wider Northeast Atlantic. Um, where we look at different levels of taxonomic specific specificity to come up with indicators. And, oops, sorry. And CPR data um, is perfect for this approach. So when we're thinking about bulk indicators, we can use the phytoplankton color index. When we're thinking about community composition indicators like diversity indices, we can use taxonomic abundance data. And if we're thinking about functional group indicators or changes in ecosystem functioning, we can use a functional group approach where we aggregate taxonomic data by life form. And it's this middle approach, the life form approach I wanna focus on today. So we've been able to develop and apply this life form approach to biodiversity assessment at the Northeast Atlantic level for policy using the CPR data in combination with the complementary data sets that I've mentioned before from the UK and now from other countries. So, in order to get life forms, we look at different species, uh, biological traits, and then group them into kind of like functional groups that we call life forms. So this graph on the left, again, I know you probably can't read it, but I just want you to get like the general vibe, um, shows meroplankton life forms on the left and hollow plankton life forms on the right from different time series. So you can quickly see the CPR time series is really long, but all of these time series show kind of some kind of variability. Um, and they're all spatially distinct, so they're complementary geographically. And then when we map these time series, um, this is where we really get some interesting information. So we can see CPR data here on the grid and then PML and Marine Scotland Science. So these are the time series that monitor meroplankton. And we've seen changes in meroplankton across all these data sets. And we found that these changes are correlated to increased sea surface temperature. And this is really useful information for policy because they need to know why are these changes happening and what are the societal consequences of changes? So in this meroplankton example, does that affect food webs? Could that affect fish? Could that affect fishing? Could that affect fisheries? Could it affect commercial markets for consumers for fish? So policymakers need this information to help us manage changes in the marine environment and help us prepare for changes in the marine environment. So in the OSPAR context, or the EU context, we have the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, or MSFD, um, whose goal is to achieve good environmental status in the marine environment. And we use this life form approach to assess progress towards that goal throughout the Northeast Atlantic. So this process um, was really innovative. We didn't Scientists didn't just arrive and give policymakers an indicator and say, here, use this indicator. Instead, we worked to develop further the life form approach so that it was scientifically robust, had papers published, had the consensus of the European scientific community, but also um, will achieve policy goals. So in this case, in a, can we use it to report towards progress, towards a good environmental status in the Marine Strategy Framework Directive? 
So we used all different data sets together, the CPR data, but also UK data sets. Now we've got more European data sets that we're working to add in as part of a new project. But I want to highlight here that the CPR is the only EU wide plankton data set available that we could use that exists for this type of assessment. Um, there's lots of single point station data sets and some that have a couple of station, but the CPR is really EU wide and can help tie those data sets together and really help us understand the changes that we're observing. So this is the kind of OSPAR European policy product, but we have something similar in the UK. So this UK version went to ministers, you don't have to read it, um, but I do kind of want you to notice how many circles are amber, how many are red and how many are green. Um, and those circles, those colors tell us about our progress towards good environmental status. Uh, in the UK, we got an amber for pelagic habitats and said good environmental status is partially achieved for the plankton. Um, but climate change is really driving plankton change in many instances, and, and we don't know if good environmental status has been achieved. So another kind of policy product I want to point out is the post note. So this is from the, the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, and they're just short four page informations on uh, information briefings on hot topics or upcoming topics for MPs to read and for ministers to read. And CPR data has been um, used in several of these. So I contributed to this one on fisheries management, another one on biodiversity, another on marine, man marine monitoring for policy. Um, and they've all used CPR research. And this means MPs and ministers are being exposed to the research that, we've, that we're doing here um, with CPR data. So I think you've kind of gotten the idea that you just, data doesn't just like appear in policy, but we have to go through a process of using that data to do good science, connecting that science to policy relevance, and then communicating it um, in the right language and the right format um, to the right policy audiences. So here in the middle is an example of some of our policy audiences for CPR data recently. So the UK Parliament, DEFRA, the European Commission, ICES, Gov.UK, OSPAR Commission, there's probably loads more we could put in there. And then on the right are some examples of what this looks like. Um, so I've just pulled out a few. So we've got ICES um, working group reports, the IPCC um, climate change assessments, use CPR data, which is amazing. RSVP state of nature, charting progress two, which was our first ever assessment towards good environmental status about 15 years ago. Um, and again, I could fill this up with MSIP with lots of other examples of where CPR data has been used to inform policy. But it's this kind of process that I think we can be very proud of with CPR data. So connecting the data to the science, to the policy application. So I thought I'd give a slide about kind of the factors behind the policy success of the CPR. So first of all, we have to start with the data. The data are amazing. There's no time series like this in marine biodiversity, um, not only the spatial extent, but also the temporal extent. Um, and, and these features of the data help us separate different signals like climate change or natural variability or anthropogenic pressures, which are really important to policy because it helps them focus their effort on management. And it means that CPR data perfectly complements lots of other data sets that are out there, our traditional net samples um, and all different other kinds of plankton sampling. The CPR has also a group of passionate advocates. So um, I'm definitely an example of that. Uh, I was recently seconded into DEFRA for two days a week. Everybody there knows how much I love the CPR, how important it is to policy. And there's examples of, of people that are advocates for the CPR all over the world. And it keeps the CPR profile raised um, and it connects CP, the CPR science to policy. Again, CPR science have this, scientists have this great spirit of collaboration um, where CPR research collab, researchers collaborate with people all over the world at all kinds of institutes and all kinds of um, universities and organizations. Um, and this drives CPR science forward in a way um, that we can connect it to policy needs that are, that are current or upcoming. Um, and then the CPR maintains an influential position in policy. So the CPR uh, has a, a key kind of leadership role in NMBAC, which is about um, quality assuring monitoring data in the UK. And then also the CPR um, 
team members are part of the UK and OSPAR pelagic habitats groups, um, which are kind of the link between plankton science and policy in the UK and OSPAR. Um, and, and I lead both of these groups as a friend of the CPR. So here's some photos when we are allowed to meet in person instead of on Zoom. So the future outlook, I thought I'd do a gratuitous slide about like where I would like to see the CPR going in policy. And I could do 10 slides, but I tried to just summarize in two points. Um, I think we should make some global CPR indicators for policy. And I think the life form uh, approach could en enable us to do that. I really like this paper that just came out by Campbell et al, where he looked at across all the GAX data sets at copepods. I think we could do something similar with the life form approach and maybe work towards a global assessment um, where we link really explicitly the CPR data and science to global EU, UK policy drivers. Um, and this would be targeted at policymakers. And I've talked to CPR um, team members and, and we talk about this all the time. And I think we'll probably start to work on it soon. Um, and it could be like an invigorated ecological status report that we used to have every year uh, with the CPR data. And it could be very policy targeted. We could give it out at DEFRA, at ICES, at the European Commission um, internationally to show how key the CPR data and CPR research are in delivering policy at multiple political scales. Um, so I'm going to stop with my favorite quote ever from a scientific paper. I wish I'd written it. And this is from Coslow and Couture in Nature 2013. And they said, ecological time series are the Cinderella's of ocean science, long neglected drudges eking out their existence at the edge of what is in fashion. They now find themselves in favor at the climate change ball. The CPR is a perfect example of that. It hasn't always been easy to keep the survey going, but we wouldn't have the knowledge about marine biodiversity change and climate change in the marine ecosystem that we have now without the CPR survey. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, and thank you to all the past and present CPR team members, the analysts, the ship's crews, researchers, workshop staff, IT admin, um, probably people that I've forgotten, I'm sorry. And then all the CPR collaborator, collaborators globally that work to get CPR data used and progress the science so that we can use it in decision-making. So thank you so much. Well, thanks, Abby. That was absolutely fantastic as ever. And I, I really loved your quote at the end, how true that is for getting funding for continuous time series data. We see it so many times. It was lovely to end with that quote. So next we'll go to um, another uh, old connection of mine, Dr. Tom Doyle. And um, it's really nice being a chair that with everything pre-recorded, I don't even have to worry about your timekeeping. So over to you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, good to see you. Um, I just share my 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 um, presentation. Okay. Um, so thanks thanks Richard for the for the warm welcome and um, and and thank you to the the organisers of the CPR ninety um, conference. It's an absolute um, pleasure um, to be invited to talk here today. Um, I'm a huge fan of the CPR and everything that it's done. I was lucky enough to spend a week um, in Plymouth um, maybe 15 years ago now, but um, I still think of it as fond memories. But so today I'm here talking about um, the application of, of the CPR and how it's provided insights on the ocean and sunfish. Oops, slides. Oh, there we go. So why talk about sunfish uh, for the CPR 90 conference? Because I, I guess most of you are probably thinking that the CPR um, sampling device probably isn't the best device for sampling the largest fish in the world uh, in terms of its aperture. But maybe some of the, the some of you might point out that perhaps the, the larvae of ocean sunfish may be occasionally uh, picked up by CPR devices that sample down perhaps off the sargassum or somewhere like that. But why, why talk about uh, sunfish? Well, they represent one of the most ecologically and functionally distinct fish taxa in our seas. So they're the largest bony fish. Um, morphologically, they're very unusual. So they're just a large swimming head. Then they're laterally compressed. They're very unusual physiological traits. They're extremely fast growers in terms of uh, fecundity. They've got one of the highest fecundities in terms of fishes. Over 300 million eggs can be released by a female. So really distinct fish. And then from an ecological perspective to feed on jellyfish. And that's where my interest comes in on them. And, and that's where the link is with the CPR. But unfortunately, for such a large fish, 
And for such an important fish, we've We've almost no historical abundance data, so it's very difficult um, to say anything about what's happening. But thankfully, there's been some recent aerial surveys that have suggested um, that they're extremely abundant. One paper by Gremier et al, I've um, shown a figure here, has found um, particularly high abundance in the Bay of Biscay and in the entrance to the English Channel, where you can have something like uh, 475 sunfish per 100 kilometers squared. So really high abundances. And this uh, was also supported by a study that was carried off Ireland that found similar uh, abundances as well off the south coast. And this led one study to suggest that sunfish, which are known predators of jellyfish, have benefited from an increase in jellyfish. And then the authors went one further to suggest that ocean sunfish could actually, actually offer clues or be an indicator to the rise of slime. So what do we mean by that? Well, essentially, um, through overfishing and warming seas, uh, we've seen a depletion of fisheries, and then we've seen an increase in jellyfish. And as a result, sunfish, sunfish are benefiting from this, and we're seeing the, this large increase in sunfish. And I just... To, to come back to that, so that rise of slime, so what does that actually mean? And I, I'm gonna go back to this old figure. This is a figure from the Sea Around Us project for, and it was uh, by Daniel Pauly's group. And where they talked about uh, fishing down marine food webs. Well, the, the rise of slime uh, links pretty much in with this concept that you know historically we've disproportionately overfished the large and long-lived fish species. So through time, we see smaller and smaller fish species um, dominating our fish catches. And at the end of this time series or, or, or of, of this um, figure, what you can see is that we'll have, a, have our oceans where it's, it's filled with smaller pelagic species and dominated by jellyfish. And what happens then, or what can happen then, is that when you have oceans dominated by, dominated by jellyfish, they can lead to kind of irreversible trophic cascades where it's very hard for fish populations to increase because there's so many jellyfish about. So is this happen? Well, without any historical data fish on, on sunfish, it's kind of difficult to examine this hypothesis of, of sunfish and benefiting from the rise of slime. So we're kind of left uncertain actually what's happening here in, in terms of sunfish. So to answer this question, we need two things. We need an index of social abundance. And thankfully, we were able to find one. And uh, not an easy thing to find, but thankfully, it was on my doorstep all along. But this is um, uh, Cape Clear, which is just located off the south coast of Ireland, the most southern tip. But since the 1970s, um, bird observers have been carrying out effort-based sea watches for seabird migrations. And so this happens from April on through, uh, through to October. And typically they're looking for seabirds like these shearwaters just flying by and they count them, but they also see um, cetaceans. But thankfully for, for, for what we're doing, they also pick up on sunfish. And this is a picture of a sunfish uh, basking at the surface. And you've got a whole lot of interesting fulmers that come over and they pick off uh, some of the sunfish parasites. But this has been going on um, since the 70s, but what's important is to record watch duration, the number of observers, sea state, wind direction, et cetera. So now we have been able to develop, we've been able to extract all the sunfish sightings and all this effort uh, information to into a sunfish abundance index. But the second thing we need, and that's why I guess I've been invited to talk here today, is that we need a jellyfish time series. And anyone who knows anything about jellyfish, there's a, there, there's a lack of jellyfish time series. They're really difficult um, uh, to get because jellyfish have been neglected and uh, generally not considered important in marine food webs. But we know that's different now, and so they are being monitored. But to get a comparable time series of jellyfish to compare or correlate with the ocean sunfish index, um, we needed to look to the CPR because it's the only place that has something of that uh, of that of that length. Um, so. But what does they actually CPR sample in terms of jellyfish? And that is something that is, um, there's some debate about. And um, we wrote a paper in, in 2010 where we did actually look at um, what the CPR samples in terms of jellyfish. And, and this is an image, the image in the middle here is part of the mesh. And you can see there's some kind of material that's caught in the mesh that is actually par uh, part of a, a Pelagian octoluca jellyfish. And if you look to the image on the, to the next to that, what it actually shows is when you zoom in, you can actually see some nematocysts. And so this then will be categorized by the analyst as a uh, solenterate tissue. Okay, and, th and that's one way how, how jellyfish are recorded by the CPR sampling, uh, 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 sampler. But what we're looking for is siphonophores because we know sunfish feed on siphonophores. And what's really wonderful about the CPR data set is that 
if an analyst, an analyst um, detects one of these swimming bells, so the image here on the right, this is what we call a calicophron siphonophore. Essentially, it's a little swimming bell. It's only maybe eight or 10 millimeters in size. But if, if that's detected on a CPR, it's recorded as a siphonophore, nectophore, or swimming bell. So what's brilliant here is we now have 50-year time series of jellyfish abundance or siphonophore abundance. And we know some fish feed on them. They don't quite feed on these calicophron siphonophores because they're so small, but they do feed on related um, siphonophores. So this is the best um, index that we can actually get in terms of to link these two together. Um, we also needed some environmental variables, so we collected some sea surface data from NOAA, and then also we looked at the phytoplankton data from the CPR, and then um, in terms of the analysis, I'm not going to get into that too much here in terms of the time, but we use a G G GLM with a hurdle to deal with imperfect detectability, essentially, um, we've lots of, some fish are really difficult to detect and we don't get, get many of them, and we've lots of zeros um, to model as well. So what did we find? Well, first of all, we, we developed the first long-term index of ocean sunfish abundance. And if you look at this main figure here, actually what it shows, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but in the, the large gray bars in the background is the effort over time. So in the 1970s, you can see we're doing over 200 um, hours of sea watching um, uh, per annum. But what you can see that through, through time, this has been relatively consistent, except in the, the, the late 80s, there was actually a, a decrease and then more recently, um, after 2011, or 2011, the actual observatory closed for several years. So uh, this has been talked about today in terms of maintaining the CPR. The same thing happens with this coastal observatory as well. So there's been difficulties maintaining this, but thankfully we have um, um, uh, um, over 50 years now of data to look at. But the important thing to look at here is the blue dots. But what you see, I'll just add a trend line on top of that. But what we can see is that Sunfish were generally absent, so we maybe had two sunfish sighted in 1970, you have one in, in 1981, but before 1989 there's very little, there's very few sunfish actually sighted off, uh, off the south coast of Ireland. But then we get a mean of six sunfish in the, uh, sighted up until the year 2000, but after that we see a marked increase where we get on average 20 or 20 plus uh, sunfish uh, per annum. And thereafter, we returned to kind of 1989, 2000 levels. And unfortunately, from 2000 onwards, we're left uncertain because the observatory was actually closed. It has started up again now, but with much reduced effort. So it's kind of um, made things a bit more difficult to say what's happening. So what do we find? Well, in terms of this is the model output. And if you look at this figure, essentially the positive values on top means that there's a higher probability of detecting a sunfish in that year. So essentially what we're shown is that there was a much higher probability of detecting sunfish in the 90s and especially in the 2000s than at any other time period in the observatory. So early on, you're just very not unlikely to see sunfish. It, and then more recently, we're not quite sure because the time series or the observatory has closed and broken down somewhat. In terms of sea surface temperature, in terms of trying to link what's happening with these sunfish, there was the, the position of the 13 degree isotherm was significantly correlated with the probability of taking the sunfish. This is best visualized here, or visual, visualized here graphically, where you can see here's Ireland, and we've got we've got the CPR down here in Plymouth. But if you look at this, this is the position of the, the 13 degree Celsius isotherm in the 60s and 70s. So it was look, look, located uh, over 200 kilometers south of Ireland. But what you can see is that um, in 90, late 1990 and the 2000s, this dramatically shifts north. And this, this kind of um, coincides with when we do see the increase in sunfish sightings. Well, what about the abundance of siphonophores? Because this is this is this is something that we wanted to link back to the rise of slime. You know, is there evidence that jellyfish are driving an increase in sunfish? So what we see was that from the CPR, so this is the presence or, or this is the detection of these calicophron siphonophores from the CPR. What we can see that is in the late 90s, um, or there's, there's pretty much an absence of them, but it, we see uh, an increase in the, the 90s, and especially after 2000, we see a dramatic increase. The abundance was positive but did not uh, show a, a, any significant correlation with the probability of detecting um, a sunfish sighting. 
So what does this mean, trying to bring it all together? Well, what we think is this is evidence of a range expansion for sunfish. And what, how, why do we say that? Well, sunfish are a highly migratory species, so they generally track the sea surface temperature. Kind of, and so they like to stay within a band of maybe 13 to 20 degrees Celsius. So they kind of move with as the water temperature increases. So, they're, so that's one. And the fact that we found that there was a significant correlation with the 30, position of the 30 degree isotherm supports, supports that. But and what many of you guys will probably know from working in in in, uh, in, in, C, in CPR is that there was well known in, uh, climate induced ecosystem change across the occurred across the northeast Atlantic in the nineteen nineties, and so we see uh, you know in terms of the plankton and I'm not going to you know in terms of the Gogran studies we can see lots of uh, plankton species moving north. But here we're, we're suggesting that sunfish are also responding to these changes that happened in the 90s. But also we see lots of uh, responses in fish, but also seabirds. But importantly, in terms of much farther north, if we go up to Iceland, Iceland and Norwegian, we see that there was a, a, an increase in the occurrence of sunfish that occurred later further north. So we see an increase in sunfish earlier in, in Irish and perhaps in UK waters too. But then it's it's we see maybe 10 years later, we see an increase further north again, suggesting that they're further increasing their range. Um, but what about the role of siphonophores? What, what do they play in this? Well, we know some fish are important predators of siphonophore, so you might expect an increase will be significantly correlated. But what, what we find is that if you look at this graph here on, on the right, some of the highest values for siphonophores also occur when we've almost no sunfish siphons. So this may reflect the broken, broken uh, data in, in the latter years of our time series. Um, but I think an important thing to really point out here is that um, what you can see is that the increase in sunfish uh, sightings indicated by this arrow here um, happened about 10 to 15 years before we see the increase in siphonophores. Okay, so there's something uh, differing ha or different happening here. The sunfish have increased first, and then it's only maybe 10 to 15 years later before we see the same increase in, 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 um, in siphonophores. So in summary, we, we, uh, we just presented the first long-term index of ocean sunfish abundance. We see there's a higher probability of taking sunfish in the 90s and 2000s. The increase in sunfish is likely triggered by an increase in temperature and the broader ecosystem-wide changes. But the significant increase in sunfonophores is not correlated with sunfish, so not supported of the idea that um, sunfish are increasing with the rise of slime. And uh, just thanks for listening, and just special thanks to all the bird observers, and especially to the taxonomists, uh, our analysts here at, at the CPR for, for giving us this um, eye into what's happening with sunfish. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Tom. That, that, was, that was fantastic as well. It was lovely to see that the... The pictures of the sunfish and particularly the, the early stages, I think I saw something in the chat about how cute they were. Um, so without more ado, I'd like to, because we've got questions and answers at the end, of course, I'd like to move on to Sarah Berth's talk, please. Hello, my name is Sarah Berth, and today I'm going to talk to you about climate change in the North Sea ecosystem and how the continuous plankton recorder survey data have been vital in improving our understanding of this topic. I work for the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. We are a research institute that specialises in environmental science, and we undertake a lot of long-term monitoring, including that of seabird populations in the North Sea. Climate change is well known to be altering the behaviour, abundance, distribution and fitness of species. And one of the most well-documented and conspicuous ways that climate change is altering wild species is in the timing of seasonal events, and this is known as phenology. So this might be, for example, the timing of laying of frog spawn, or the laying of eggs by birds, or spring flowering events. And many spring events have been getting earlier over time in response to climate warming. And this is important because if different parts of a food web are altering the timing of their phenology at a different pace, then this can lead to what is known as trophic mismatch, which is a mismatch between the timing of food availability and the timing of predator demand for that food. And this is illustrated here. So here, for example, if you have some prey, such as caterpillars, which have a clear peak during the year, 
then predators want to match the timing of their peak resource demand, in this case, peak breeding for predators such as great tits, with the availability of their prey. And here, in this example, the great tits are pretty well matched to the timing of their prey. But if great tits don't respond as much to climate warming as their prey do, this can lead to a mismatch, and then they're not overlapping very well with the availability of their prey. And work by Stephen Thackeray at UKCEH, which looked at a whole load of different phenological trends, 25,000 of them across marine, freshwater and terrestrial species, suggested that trophic mismatch might be a problem. And this is because this work showed that phenological shifts were occurring at different rates on average for different parts of the trophic levels. So for example, secondary consumers seem to be responding at a slower pace of change compared to primary producers and primary consumers. And when this was projected using UK climate projections under different emission scenarios, it suggested that primary consumers might be having the greatest response to climate because they had a higher sensitivity. However, we know a lot less about marine ecosystems and phenological change compared to terrestrial ones. And this is despite the fact that marine ecosystems are predicted to have a more rapid pace of climate warming compared to terrestrial ecosystems. So we were interested in looking at the North Sea food chain to see whether phenological change might be occurring and whether there was any evidence of trophic mismatch. So the North Sea is a good candidate for looking at these topics because it's a highly seasonal system with clear plankton pulses occurring throughout the year. It's also known to have undertaken um, rapid sea temperature rises, and there's overwhelming evidence that global warming is hitting various parts of the seabed populations and also the ecosystem. And within this ecosystem, sand eels are key species during the breeding season for many of the seabirds. But the problem is that we often lack good fish data on timing and phenology. And seabirds, which are the top predators in this system, are really useful indicators because they tend to be quite sensitive to changes occurring lower down in the trophic levels. And they're also relatively easy to monitor during the breeding season. So we used over 26 years of phenology data from a different variety of sources. So we're indebted to the continuous plankton recorder survey data, which gave us monthly mean abundance data over an area um, surrounding our focal seabird colony for phytoplankton species and also copepod species through the continuous plankton recorder survey trawls across this area. Not only that, but the continuous plankton recorder larval sand eel data was used to model hatch estimates and growth data by combining these data sets with data sets from fish brought in by seabirds. And whilst not as impressive as 90 years of plankton data, Next year will mark the 50th year that UKCEH has been collecting long-term seabird monitoring data on the Isle of May, which is shown here by the red star. And we've been collecting median egg date and timing of breeding data since the 1970s. And what's interesting about seabirds is that their breeding has been getting later over time compared to terrestrial birds. So here, if you see Blue bars, it indicates that birds are getting earlier. So from a review by Parmesan, it shows terrestrial birds as the first bar getting earlier and also European shags, although this is not significant. Whereas most of the seabird species that we look at are actually getting later over time. And why might this be? When we looked at phenology data to see whether different trophic levels of the food web were matched in timing to those of lower trophic levels, we know found no evidence of matching phenology. So what this means, for example, is that the timing of copepod predators was not matched to that of diatom prey or sand eels to copepods or seabirds to sand eels. And this is important because it shows evidence that there's no phenological matching happening in the system. But when we thought about this a bit more, we thought it was not that surprising that seabird phenology, i.e. the timing of chick rearing, is not well matched to sandal hatch states. This is because it's actually prey size, energetic value and quality that are known to be important for seabirds. 
and bigger sand deals have a much higher energetic value than smaller sand deals. So using the CPR data and also the, the seabird data of fish brought back to the breeding colony, we estimated mean hatching dates over time and found that sand deals started off by hatching later over time, but then got earlier. And if you look at growth rates in the last part of the time series, it's clear that growth rates have declined over time. And this is important because the size of sand eels during the seabird breeding season would depend both on hatch dates and also growth rates. So what we did was we considered the date that sand eels were predicted to reach a certain size threshold. And this was chosen because this is a reasonable size of prey that we observe in the seabird diet. And although the bigger the fish, the more energetic value it has to seabirds, this threshold size is an appropriate metric to look at because although seabirds prefer larger prey, they don't want to delay breeding and wait too long for fish to grow because this would reduce the survival prospects of young after fledging. So this metric, this, sandal, this date sandals reach 55 millimetres, takes into account both the shift in sandal hatch dates and also this observed decline in growth rates. And when you look at this, it's clear that the date sand eels reached a decent size has been getting later over the study period, with a particularly late timing in 2004. And now when we look to see if the timing of peak energy demand in seabirds, i.e. mid-chick rearing, is matched to the timing of sand eels reaching this decent size, we see that seabirds are indeed altering the timing of their breeding to match changes in sand eel size. So the only one that's not doing this is shags, which is showing, showing no evidence of phenological matching with sand eels, and kittiwakes are showing the biggest shift in relationship. However, if seabirds were perfectly matching the change in timing in sand eel size, we would expect to see a one-to-one -one relationship in timing, and we don't see this. So what this means is that the rate of change of seabird breeding in timing is not able to keep pace with the map and match the changes in timing of sandal size in this system. And furthermore, because as I said before, larger fish have a much higher energetic content and are so more valuable and of higher quality to seabirds, what this means is that over the study period, there's been a decline in the predicted size of sandals brought back to the colony. And this is borne out by data that we observe in the birds as well. So from this, we would expect the steepest decline in size to be occurring in shags and also in kittiwakes. And when you translate this into declines in energetic value per average sandal brought back by seabirds, you can see that the declines in energetic value are significant, particularly for shags and kittiwakes. And this makes sense because shags actually have a very variable phenology. They're the seabird that are not appearing to be getting later like the other ones. They don't show a trend in their phenology. And it appears that they're not tracking sandal size in the same way as the other species. And this means because they're effectively breeding too early for sandals to have attained a decent size, they see very big predicted energy declines in their prey. And shags are diving species that are capable of diving um, underneath the water Whereas kittiwakes, which are surface feeders, are shown to have the biggest phenology shift. So these, they seem to be the species that most closely is tracking changes in their prey, but they're seeing very large energetic declines in the sizes and hence energy quality of their prey. But when we examine in more detail, we see that these two species are in fact altering their diet to some extent and becoming dependent on other prey. So here in the plot, the black bars show young sand eels, which are known as O groups, so that's young of the year. The red bars show older sand eels, one year and older. The blue bars show clupeids, which are things like sprats, and the white bars show other prey. So what you can see is that shag diet since the mid 2000s has become much more diverse and much less heavily reliant on sand eels. Kittiwake diet has also shown less reliance on sandals and has become more dependent on clupeids. And further investigations into shags, for which we have really good quality individual level data, fail to find a relationship between annual breeding success and either sea surface temperature 
or the proportion of sandals in the diet. And what this suggests is that mismatch is not having fitness consequences for how well these birds produce. So in fact, if you look at the plot at the bottom, you'll see that breeding success in shags as the number of um, chicks fledged per pair has actually increased since the mid 1990s over time. So whilst mismatch may not be impacting shags, and they seem to have been able to shift their diet in response to changing sandhill quality, this may not be the case for other species. And this is something we're hoping to look at in more detail in the future. So to conclude, our work highlights the need to think carefully about the phenological metric that you're examining. And for seabirds, the timing of size in their prey is more important than the timing of hatch. And we showed that sandal size has declined over time due to later hatching initially, but also due to poor growth rates in later years. And although seabirds have been changing their phenology to breed later, the pace of change has not been sufficient to keep pace with the changing timing of sandals reaching a decent size. And what this has meant is it's led to significant declines in the energetic value of prey brought back during the crucially important breeding season when energetic demands for seabirds are very high. And shags, some species of seabird have been able to shift their diet in response. So shags in particular seem to have shown a diversification of their diets and show no obvious impact of mismatch on breeding success. However, for species that are constrained to only feed at the surface, such as kittiwakes, or those that are only able to carry single prey items back to the breeding colony, such as guillemots, may not be quite so adaptable. And further work is needed to understand the fitness consequences of this observed mismatch with key prey. And this work marks a huge collaborative effort with a number of different people and different data sets particularly with David Johns and the continuous plankton recorder data. And we would like to thank everyone that's contributed and to all our project partners who record phenology data in the UK. Thank you. Well, wow, Sarah, th thank you for an amazing talk. I mean, three talks in out of the four in this session and, and I just can't help but react by thinking, what a testament to the fantastic resource that we see from the CPR. You know, we've, we've jumped from Abby and the talk about plankton linking to global policy, to, to, to sunfish, to seabirds. You know, the, the, the value of this, this time series and data set is, is absolutely phenomenal. So no pressure, Claire, over to you, to Claire Russell for, for the last talk in this uh, series of four before we go over to, to question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much for tuning in and sticking around to hear about some of the research that we're doing. My name is Claire Ostel, and I'm going to be talking to you about the continuous plankton plastic. The possibilities are endless recorder. Apologies for the title. I um, was on maternity leave and I got a bit carried away, but essentially it's true. The possibilities are endless and um, it's very exciting working with such a brilliant data set. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that none of this research or data would be available um, without the hard work of the analysts, the workshop uh, and operations teams, and the volunteer ship and crew that tow the CPRs for us, and the funders, so thank you very much. Um, just to give you a brief outline, I'm just going to highlight a couple of important things about the methodology of the CPR and, and um, that's needed for, for this talk. Um, I know we've had some brilliant talks already, you know, so hopefully we know what the CPR is and how it works. Um, I'm then gonna give you a bit of background into some of the research that was done looking at microplastics from CPR samples, um, and also some of the more recent work looking at macroplastics. So the way I term micro and macroplastics in this talk is anything above five millimeters is a macro larger plastic and everything uh, below five millimeters is a microplastic. And then I'm just gonna give you a couple of slides um, on kind of what's next and some of the exciting new stuff that's coming out. So this is a GIF uh, that Rob Camp put together and I just wanted to put it in there to show you that although I'm gonna be talking mostly about the North Atlantic CPR survey, we have a number of um, sister surveys all over the world, um, including 
the North Pacific, uh, the Southern Ocean and the Australian CPR survey that we've just had a great talk from Ant about. Um, but essentially, the CPR survey is global and um, through the Global Alliance of CPR surveys, we have this, um, this large reach and coverage. Uh, here at the MBA, we store all of our samples from the North Atlantic and from the North Pacific. So essentially, this is a biological library. Um, it's a temperature controlled room and all of the samples are preserved. Uh, we have over 60 years of samples uh, from the North Atlantic now and up to 20 years from the Pacific. So this is really important. These are essentially a historical snapshot of what was in the water column at that point in time and space. Um, so this is, this is hugely valuable. As you've seen through the fantastic talks that we've had already, um, the CPR is primarily focused at monitoring the plankton, which are hugely important for the ecosystem, uh, for exchange of carbon. And the great thing about having the global coverage and the large coverage that we do in the North Atlantic, um, we're able to track these changes uh, because of the consistent way the data has been collected. So there's been many good examples of, of the kind of uh, key stories that have come out using CPR data. And I've just highlighted one of them here as an example. This was Steph Hinder's paper published in Global Change Biology. And um, she was able to interpolate uh, the data onto these maps representing uh, a cold water species, which is here in blue of copepod called Calanus finmarchicus, and a warm water species. So it's a species of copepod called Calanus helgolandicus that's often associated with warmer waters. Um, and she mapped those for each decade, going from the 60s up into the 2000s. And what she demonstrated is there's a range contraction of cold water species and this range expansion of warm water species. Um, and she linked this with the warming of the waters. It's been there's been a number of stories that are similar to this and are very important. Often they're linked to, to changes in uh, the food, so food quality, particularly cold water species are thought to have a higher lipid content, so Calanus finmarchicus, for example. So those changes may have knock-on impacts on their predators, fisheries in the area. Okay, moving on to the microplastics. So um, this photo was taken by David Lichwager. He's a National Geographic photographer. He came to Plymouth about three years ago um, and we went out into Plymouth Sound on the research vessel, the MBA Sepia. Um, and this was just a very quick plankton uh, net that we put over the side of the boat and he picked out these specimens and put them into a drop of water and took a photograph and he was highlighting the impact of microplastics on the oceans. So you can see there's a flake here and a fiber and what looked like starfish and decapod larvae and a krill. And you can tell I'm not a taxonomist. Um, but often people think this is what the CPR samples look like and perhaps what we wished our samples looked like. They're very pretty and they're intact. But just to show you, this is actually what the uh, plankton analysts are looking at on a day to day down a microscope. Um, here's the silk mesh, the weave of the silk. You can see a couple of nice dinoflagellates there, and this is what we would term a microplastic. So we would record this as a red strand in our database. And this work on microplastics and, and now what we record in our database stemmed from um, research done by Richard Thompson and his group, who's based at Plymouth University. So um, this was published in 2004 in Science. And what Richard and his group did is they took uh, samples from two transects of the CPR survey in the north um, of the UK and they took subsamples from each decade in the 1960s, 70s, 80s and 90s and they counted the microplastics and ran them through a process called FTIR which is an infrared, infrared method for determining what type of plastic it is. And this was really a seminal paper. It kind of first coined the term microplastics. It pointed out that we might have an issue um, and that they, they are increasing since the 1960s. Um, so there's been many, many different papers and research that have stemmed from this, um, and it had a huge impact. Um, something that I've highlighted here is just after the 80s, we didn't see the continued increase that you might expect from the incre increased production of plastics. But I'm going to come back to that when I talk about the macroplastics. 
so since this seminal paper by Richard Thompson, um, the CPR survey started to record the presence and absence of microplastics within our samples. So this map is the North Atlantic, um, where we've got a red dot is where a microplastic was present and where we've got an open circle, there was no microplastic seen in the sample. And then again, since 2016, we've now started to count and actually categorize those microplastics. So these are these black dots. So those are uh, related, the size of the dots related to the counts of microplastic within the sample. And you can see we generally get more in the North Sea where we have lots of CPR trawls. And the kind of take home from this is that we're seeing microplastics everywhere. <clears throat> and this has been in a lot of the rich literature as well. Roughly 20% of all of the CPR samples now have microplastics within them. And uh, just to point out, we always present this data with the caveat that these microplastics that I'm showing you here have not been formally identified and uh, there may be a baseline level of contamination. So we do have some research uh, that was done by a PhD student um, who was able to record the baseline level of contamination. But what we're seeing here is above that level of contamination. So some of the issues that are associated with collecting plank, uh, plastic time series, sorry, are that it's very difficult to get a consistent open ocean time series. And as you know, this is a lot to do with cost. So taking out research vessels is very expensive, but also maintaining a long term time series uh, is, again, very costly. And for larger macroplastics, these are virtually non-existent. We've got some really useful um, volunteer data that's been submitted through schemes. And these are often, as you know, going down to the beach, people reporting on the amount of plastics and what they're finding. Um, but there's very few consistent time series. Another thing to highlight is always contamination. Um, and we're very careful um, at re reporting on that whenever we present our microplastic data. And almost all microplastic data sets do have a, a baseline level of contamination. And it's important to, to think about and remember whenever you're using these samples. The other thing to note is that a lot of the techniques that are used to formally identify what type of plastic they are, are quite expensive. So we're not able to do that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with our CPR samples. Which led us on to the next piece of work. Macroplastics, so the large stuff. So these pictures were taken by Jules and I think Lance in the workshop. And essentially we started to get more and more entanglements on the continuous plankton recorder. Um, Often these were things that you'd expect to entangle more, so not a big piece of plastic, hard plastic, but fishing line or net or bags. Um, and something that's brilliant about the CPR survey is that we have these tow logs, these tow sheets. And um, the crew will record the sea state, you know, whether it's cloudy, um, how rough the sea might have been. And they'll also record anything that was uh, pulled off of the CPR or any issues maybe when they were deploying the CPR, um, anything like that. And we often get seaweed, bits of wood, whatever, jammed on the CPR, and those will get recorded as well. So what we were able to do is start to look at this. So as I said, there's very few uh, consistent data sets, and many of them are not showing a trend of increasing plastic that you'd expect to see with the amount of plastic that we've been producing and uh, not managing our waste properly. So the earliest kind of studies looking at plastics were in the 1960s and they found um, in the stomachs of some seabirds and turtles that they were getting plastic pieces. Um, there's some also entanglement case studies, particularly with fur seals. And again, they were able to show a time series, as you can see here, but they were not able to show a significant increase. What we did with our database is we did a word search, essentially. we have all of the comments from the tow logs in the database and we were able to pull out words associated with anthropogenic um, entanglements. So things like the word net, line, rope, bag, monofilament or string. We pulled all of these out of the database and created a macroplastic entanglement data set. And it was really interesting. Um, essentially, uh, we were able to highlight some hotspots of entanglements, which is quite important for many marine mammals and potentially seabirds. Uh, we were able to demonstrate some of the earliest recordings of anthropogenic entanglements. So in 1957, 
The CPR recorder was fouled by trawl twine just up here. And we had a entanglement by a plastic bag in 1965. Um, all of this data is published online alongside the paper in Nature Communications. Um, and what crucially we were able to show was this significant increase beyond the 1960s and 90s um, into the 2000s of plastic in the oceans. Um, and just to point out these grey bars here are natural entanglements, so things like seaweed and wood. And this work um, had a huge impact. We had a lot of journalists uh, wanting to know what was going on and reporting on the study. Um, it was quite eye-opening for me. Uh, I've worked mostly with the plankton data and with carbon data sets and um, it was it was interesting coming at it from a different angle because I'm not used to working with plastic but the thing that uh, it highlighted to me is that uh, the general public were able to relate to plastics and to be able to feel like they could actually do something about it was important um, and it also highlighted the kind of circular route of talking about environmental issues. So um, the fact that we're impacting on our environment through plastics could also um, lead on to the fact that we're impacting our environment through what we're putting into the atmosphere and the warming that we're seeing uh, more recently. One of the other really neat um, applications of the data was this by Keith McNulty. So I'm just demonstrating it here so that if anyone wants to have a go they can but essentially he created a web app using R Shiny, which is a free uh, software available and a blog post in his github repository here so if anyone wants to go and have a play with the data or just learn how to use R and Git um, or R Shiny to build apps it's a really useful tool um, so have a look at that there's still many unanswered questions uh, particularly looking at the transfer through the food web. We've got colleagues at PML who are working on this. Um, also the harmful impacts, you know, the toxicity, whether plastic is leaching uh, any kind of toxin into the environment or into our bodies. We know they're everywhere. We know we're likely consuming them. Um, Andrew Turner at Plymouth University has done some really neat work picking out plastic flakes. Um, so these are actually paint flakes, which are a type of microplastic and looking at the toxicity of those. Um, we're also starting to link with models from groups in the Netherlands um, and there's some neat work by Lauren Beerman who's been able to identify plastics from satellite. So we're, we're hoping to, to work alongside some of those groups. What next? Well, um, with the network that the CPR has, uh, the logical um, step has been to start to integrate sensors onto the CPR and it's a really exciting new area that we're getting into. Uh, we've trialled a number of different CTDs measuring conductivity, temperature, fluorescence. Um, there's been a water sampler that I'm sure Rowena is going to talk about with some of her molecular work, which is really exciting. Um, we've now got a new CO2 sensor that we're going to be trialling and we're hoping to test uh, with a PhD student coming on board. Um, so essentially, if the sensor is not changing the flight or the way that the CPR samples, then we are willing to give it a go. Um, obviously, the CPR is moving rapidly at 20 knots and often gets knocked about on the side of the ship. So we need to make sure those sensors are robust. But if people have sensors that they're wanting to trial, then we are willing to give it a go. Just to quickly summarise, the CPR samples are archived and stored and they are an incredibly useful snapshot in time. Essentially, as methods and technologies develop, uh, people are coming with new ideas of things to look at and they're able to go back through those samples and demonstrate um, important findings. Contamination of these samples always needs con careful consideration, so we're very careful about how we handle the samples and, and when we get them out. Uh, the macroplastics, as I showed, did show the expected increase that people had been expecting to see. As new technologies are emerging, um, we're really excited about using our network of CPRs to expand the data set. And just a final take home message, always write in your logbooks. This is, um, it's key really, as, as everything moves more and more to digital, a lot of information is lost. And we're very good at the CPR and we're very lucky that we work with Dash uh, to archive our data, but we still have a lot of our information handwritten and stored, um, and that is crucial. Thank you for listening and thanks again to many of the funders.
Well, thank you very much, Claire. I mean, a fantastic way to finish those four talks. You know, we've gone from, from policy to sunfish to birds to plastic in the oceans. I mean, what better demonstration of the importance of the CPR, but also, and, and it's a slight frustration to me that the, the you know, back to Abby's talk of the this, this sort of Cinderella effect, the importance of having this long-term monitoring data. And, and in my mind, it takes me to a, a presentation that was given by a, a former director of the NBA, Steve Hawkins, and he would list all of these time series going back to the 1900s and how the only things that had stopped them over a hundred years nearly was two world wars and then a cutting government funding. And I, it, it just nags the question in my mind, how do we make sure we maintain that, 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 that the funding for this really critical work for another 90 years? But anyway, that, let's go to questions because I'm sure there must be questions for, for those four fantastic presenters. Uh, yeah, there certainly are. So we've got some questions here. There's there's a couple for Tom initially, but perhaps all of the speakers that um, spoke in this theme could switch your cameras and microphones on, um, and then we can uh, see you in one screen. That would be fantastic. Um, so Tom, first question for you was a, a quite a nice simple one, hopefully, um, was just asking about the distribution of the sunfish and how far north we think they might have extended so far. Okay. Um... Well, in terms of the, the data set that we were looking at, it, we're really looking at Cape Clear, which is the southern tip of, our, of Ireland. And so that's where our time series was based. But, you know, in terms of what we know, we definitely have seen them up in, up in Norway and, and Iceland. Some fish will be sighted up there. Might only be five or 10 a year, um, but they are being detected that far, far north now. So um, I, I guess the thing to, re to remind ourselves is that they are a migratory species, but they are pushing up that far, that far north right now. So, um, so certainly around the UK, um, you, you're, you can expect to see some fish almost anywhere. Great stuff, thank you, Tom. And then there's another one here. Well, I'm not sure if I'm getting that audio feedback. Um, asking, why do you think that siphonophore numbers are increasing? Yeah, that's that's a tricky question, and um, so it's it's hard to know to um, to be sure what's what's driving the siphonophore increase. Um, like, if we look at the sunfish, what we think, you know, in terms of the the sorry, I started again. In terms of siphonophores, we're not quite sure. Like, if you look at it, it's it could be linked with prey, um, but when we see that dramatic increase you know, you expect that maybe what's happening in that time series is that these siphonophores have pushed into that kind of range within the system because some of these siphonophores, again, are more of a, of, of a warmer water species. So maybe the increase is linked to that. The suitability of the habitat is becoming better, but we're not seeing siphonophores pushing as far north as we're seeing with the sunfish. Um, because look, the sunfish are migratory, so they can move you know, hundreds of kilometers um, in a season, whereas siphonophores are restricted to, to, to where they are. But what we do think that's happened is that we are seeing changes in the oceanography and the strength of the shelf edge current and things like that. So the shelf edge current that runs up along the, the, the shelf, that could be driving some of these things or transporting some of these siphonophores um, uh, around. And that's maybe why we're seeing an increase in some of these species. But it's, it's, it's something that we're just, we're beginning to look at because it's, it's um, in terms of these siphonophores, we haven't been looking at them. And it's only recently that we've been looking at these time series. Great stuff. Thank you, Tom. And one final question from David Sims. Um, in coastal and shelf habitats of Northeast Atlantic, smaller sunfish appear more common and rely more on benthic prey than pelagic gelatinous prey. Um, and could that explain the lack of correlation of sunfish and siphonophore abundance? Yes, no, that's a, that's a really good point, uh, David. Um, yeah, that, that's the thing. We do see an ontogenetic shift in, in terms of the prey of what these animals are feeding on. So sunfish, when they are younger, and in the coastal waters, when you do see smaller sunfish, so they are more likely to feed on, 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 on a variety of prey, including crustaceans. Um, but we do know they also feed on siphonophores, so if siphonophores are there, but it, it could, yeah, it could absolutely explain uh, the lack of correlations so is a really good point. Great stuff, thank you. And a question that I think, Abby, you're going to love here. Um, so um, somebody from our social media platform is asking, how do you get policymakers excited about plankton? Oh, 
Oh, that's such a good question. I knew you um, that one. Yeah, well, I'm quite excitable, so I think I think that also helps. Uh, but I try to I try to make it really relatable. Um, so when I give a talk, I usually start out with like a picture of like sponge plankton from SpongeBob. Because I'm like, oh, who knows who knows who this is? And people will be like, yeah, I have kids. Um, or try to like get them to think about plankton because what we take for granted in, in Plymouth, especially, is that we see the sea every day. And when I'm working in Brussels or in Westminster or Tokyo or whatever. Um, people are, you know, naturally less connected with the sea. So I think it's really important to kind of spark that like, oh, this does matter to me. And using pop culture is a really good way. I'm modeling one of the plankton shirts right now. Well done, thank you. <laughs> um, Gmail available yeah. online. <laughs> so using <laughs> pop culture is a good way or, or, or the white cliffs of Dover or, or the fact that jellyfish are plankton um, and you can see them. And then the next step is to show why plankton are important to, to policymakers. So, you know, fishing is so high profile, pretty much globally, but definitely very, very strong in the UK. Um, so the links between plankton and, and fish um, is really, they're really critical to point out. And you've seen a lot of that in the talks today. Um, mola Mola is a good one. Like I didn't really know the sunfish link. So I'll definitely be using that when I talk. Uh, to policy because it's a charismatic megafauna um, and and I think was it Charles that talked about the North Atlantic oh, right whales yeah I mean I was right. dying I was like oh this is so good for policy it's like the holy grail is something cute that everybody loves linked to plankton um, so I, I try to show why it's important to them and then why it's important to whatever policy they're working on so if it's the UK marine strategy or um, our fishing policy when we when we left the EU um, or the UK Marine Strategy Framework Directive and try to directly connect plankton to whatever it is they're working on very, very explicitly. Uh, so another example would be the sustainable development goals. So just show as explicitly as possible how our plankton can like, or our data about plankton and our research, why do you as a policymaker, why do you need this? And basically convince them you can't do your job without this data, so you need to fund the CPR. <laughs> so cool. I go from SpongeBob to like, please fund the CPR in like ten minutes, probably. Um, Sounds and, like a good journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and apart from the fact that obviously plankton are just incredibly striking, unique looking, and all of that imagery that we can use to engage people as well, I think is is so vital. So great, and especially Thank if, you for that. and I love it when I can get policy people to come to Plymouth because that's even one of the best things you can do is take them into the lab at the MBA when it's all the CPRs and be like, some of these have been used since somebody said earlier, um, was it Jonathan in the Arctic? Some of these have been, you know, were made in the 1940s and look, we're still using them. And isn't this amazing? It's not something that, that needs to be upgraded as like IT advances every year. Like this is an amazing piece of equipment um, that has like a historical past and like suck people in that way a little bit too. All right, see, I, could, I told you I could talk about this forever. So I'll stop. I'm sure you could, I'm <laughs> sure you could. And, and, you know, something as simple as our flow cam that we have here as well, being able to see the water go live across the, the very thin area. I don't know how to technically explain it perfectly, but then to be able to see that plankton live that's in that sample is, is really hard hitting, I think. And it's just something that, that people have never seen before. So it's it's great. Plank we all I think we're all converted to loving plankton in this audience today. Um, great stuff, thank you. Um, and we've got another couple of questions here for Sarah. So Sarah, have you seen the reports of odd guillemot behavior recently? And lots being seen very close to shore, which aren't scared of humans, and reports saying it's been a very good season. So there are simply lots of giant juveniles, others saying they've been driven inshore due to lack of food. Do you have any response to that? Yeah, sure. So for those who haven't been aware of it, we're getting a lot of reports on Twitter and social media platforms that there's been lots of dead guillemots washing up down the east coast of the UK. And the guillemots have been exerting strange behaviours as well. They're being seen up rivers, which is very unusual. Uh, so the big question is why, and there's a number of different hypotheses, but it's very unusual to see large numbers of dead guillemots at this time of year. You'd normally expect them to be out in the central North Sea at this time, and also to see them so close in. We're also getting reports of dead fish along the coast as well. So at the moment, we don't know if it's due to starvation. The corpses are certainly very emaciated and not weighing very much, which suggests that they haven't got food. But at the same time, we're hearing reports that there's flocks feeding very well off the coast and there are fish being seen very close in. 
So whether it's um, food and starvation or whether it's to do with disease or potentially contaminants and pollution at the moment, we don't know, but we're looking into it and we would appreciate any uh, reports of dead guillemots as well at UKCEH. Great, thank you. And Rowena had a follow up question on that as well. Rowena, do you want to um, just uh, make sure that your microphone is live? Hello, yes. yes can you hear me? You. Yes, we can. Thanks very much. I don't know. Sometimes I think there was similar. I mean, like I agree, there could be a number of reasons, but uh, sort of some some sort of odd behaviour from sea mammals and seabirds. Sometimes when there's some, um, as, as was mentioned, contaminants like uh, toxic algae can produce some um, uh, toxins that affect the brains and behaviour. Um, so that you know that could be that, or infections and diseases have a similar kind of effect on the on brains. But, uh, perhaps the lack of food and, you know, um, additional stresses may be affecting um, that. Is, could you comment on that? Uh, has there been any contaminant rises? We've got a project at the moment that's actually looking at contaminants throughout this area of the North Sea. Um, so we have got some nice samples over the last summer and the winter. So hopefully we'll be able to answer that question. And certainly we're collecting some samples to try and look at this. At the moment, we don't know, but often these things can act in tandem. So extreme weather is known to also interact with, um, for example, parasitism or disease, um, potentially contaminants as well. So that might well be the case. It's interesting that we're only seeing dead guillemots largely. We're not seeing other species washing up in large numbers. So whether that means it's not an algal bloom or something like that, we don't yet know. Great, thank you, sir. Thank you, Irina. Um, and we've got a question from Paul Hart. I know that Paul, you've um, had your microphone on before and asked the question, so I wondered if you'd like to do the same or I can read it out for you. Are you there, Paul? You can hear me. There we go. Yes, we can. Thanks, Paul. Oh, you've gone again. I'll just read out the question. So um, Cushing in the 1980s elaborated his match-mismatch uh, hypothesis. I'm here. I'm oh, here. he's there. Here we go. Sorry, there you no, go. I, 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 he comes up with a message saying, do you want to unmute? Yeah, I didn't see it. Um, yes, uh, in the 1980s, uh, David Cushing, who was at Lowestoft, proposed his match-mismatch theory uh, of mainly relating to place to try and explain the uh, variation in recruitment. So he hypothesized that place larvae have to feed on plankton and the timing of the occurrence of the plankton peak and the fish larval production was critical to the survival of the, the year class. And I wondered, I was just wondering whether this is sort of fed into the general literature or whether it's just something which is known in the fisheries world and no one has bothered to follow up in detail. Well, certainly it has reached across all the different um, sort of ecosystems and things. So the mismatch stuff that I presented has been particularly well picked up in terrestrial systems. And there's some really, really nice examples of work looking at mismatch between actually passerine birds and things like caterpillars and also top predators such as sparrowhawks that's happened in the Netherlands, which are really fantastic data sets. And in terms of the North Sea, I think things have moved on. And perhaps an important point to make that is that mismatch, you need to look at different parts of the cycle. And there's some really nice work by T. Renier, who's found, for example, I'll talk about sand eels because that's the fish species we're most interested in. But they found that sand eel hatch time was actually related to um, seasonal temperatures in the autumn and winter rather than the spring temperatures that we looked at in our study. And that's because it influences gonad and egg development. Whereas the copepod timing, the prey of the sandal larvae, mostly responded to February temperatures. And actually it's this mismatch occurring because of these different responses to temperatures at different times of the year that seems to be driving changes in sandal recruitment. And that's a really nice example of that. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we've just got one final question here from uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, would you like to switch your microphone on and ask your question? Camera two, if you like, as a panelist. There you go. Yeah, we can see and hear you, Jonathan. Sorry, was that uh, was that the question for Tom? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So Tom, I just uh, wondered whether you'd also considered some of the ocean bio biogeographic information system um, data that's available for sunfish 
when I open that up and look up sunfish, it looks like the real boundary at the at the northern latitude that cuts across some of those, uh, maybe across some of those isotherms uh, that I think you presented in your talk. So just wondered if that might be a resource that could link um, some of the work uh, from Ireland to maybe the Western Atlantic and even uh, cut across some of those CPR lines that uh, uh, transit across the oceans. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I wasn't aware of it. So, um, you know, it looks fantastic. I'll definitely be digging into that. And um, it'd, be, it'd be lovely to test, you know, because we just had that single coastal observatory, you know, so um, to be able to expand that out. Obviously, um, you know, I don't know in terms of the time series, how far that kind of data set goes back. And but certainly it'd be, it'd be great to look at that. So, I guess yeah. the, the advantage of the data set that you presented is the uh, the effort information as well. Uh, yeah. A little bit different than presence only uh, data for for uh, long uh, or potentially long time series as in OBIS. So yeah, very yeah, no, but, to but definitely work. be great to, to have a look at that. I, I wasn't aware of it. So so thanks. Okay, thank you. We've just got one final question here actually from Sonia as well. Sonia, would you like to put your camera and microphone on? I will um, just apologies because it's uh, breakfast time here before my son goes off to school. So there'd be some background noises. Um, it wasn't really a question. Uh, I just uh, was commenting that there was some um, with, associated with the North Pacific marine heat wave. There's been um, a lot of uh, mass mortality events in seabirds and some of that were, they were looking at um, harmful algal blooms as one cause, but the um, the, specific, the species specific responses seem to be more linked to um, trophic linkages and, and you know, poor forage fish and particularly high metabolic demands of one species of seabird that was, was poorly affected. So um, it was really just kind of, you know, matching with what other people were saying earlier. Great. Thank you, Sonia. I hope you get to have a rest once your son goes to school. I know it's no uh, early hours for you. Thank you for joining us at this late time. Um, so just before I hand back to Richard, just to say that um, if you do want to sign up as a member of the MBA, there is a code CPR90, which is valid until the 20th of September, which allows you a uh, free annual subscription to the Journal of Marine Biological Association. So that's CPR90. There'll be a link shared in our chat very soon. So something you could do with the next 10 minute chat. So we'll have a 10 minute break, uh, sorry, 15 minute break. We're gonna start a little bit later. So 3.45 to join us for our final session, which is the future of CPR. And I'll just hand you back to Richard now to finish up this theme. Thanks all the speakers. Well, thanks very much. I just wanted to, to, to endorse that. Thank you to all the speakers and to the participants, literally, you know, worldwide from early in the morning to late at night, a really fantastic, turnout and you know such a fantastic set of talks emphasizing the importance of the CPR you know historically and also I think look into the future particularly with with Abby's talk for you know what the promise is for the next um for the next 90 years fingers crossed so uh, I know I won't be here to celebrate 180 years but I wish the CPR all the very best it's been a key you know really key part of my own research you know we wouldn't have seen that rise in awareness of work on microplastics without that data that came from the CPR that could never have been envisaged at the time Sir Alistair Hardy first dipped his nets in the water. So thank you very much, everybody. Here's to a very happy 90th anniversary and looking forward to the future. Thank you. Oh yes, become an MBA member. I've been one since I was a student. Your time to do it now. Me too. Thank you, Richard, for that final great endorsement. And thank you for chairing this last session. And we'll see you all at 3.45.